Jr. Welcome to my micro talk on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness for Fort Hayes State University uh, novella class. First off, I would like to note for anyone not involved in the class that any page numbers I mention refer to Heart of Darkness as it appears in the third edition of the Norton Introduction to the Short Novel edited by Jerome Beatty. In the study of literature, the challenge is often determining a writer's motives for a work. With, usually this is done without any input from the writer himself. This isn't the case for Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. In fact, we have correspondence to Blackwood's magazine, where the piece was first published, in which Conrad states that he sees the story as a critique of imperialism. However, it's important to understand that the piece may not be a critique of imperialism in general, but rather a specific type of imperialism that Conrad himself found distasteful. In the article Bound in Blackwoods, The Imperialism of the Heart of Darkness in its Immediate Context, William Atkinson points out that by studying the text in terms of its original format, that of a serial in a magazine, particularly a magazine like Blackwoods magazine, we can see that the piece is a critique specifically of the imperialism of King Leopold of Belgium, the ruler of the Congo Free State. While King Leopold is never specifically named, nor is Belgium for that matter, Atkinson makes a convincing case that readers at the time, especially the readers of Blackwood's magazine, who would have been a part of, of the, the most influential people in imperialistic England, would have no doubt made the connection between the poorly run company of the Heart of Darkness and King Leopold's actions in the Congo, from the railroad that never seems to go anywhere to the forced labor of the natives, which is a result of a labor tax that King Leopold imposed, um, to the general um, unavailability of supplies in places where they were needed and the abundance of supplies in places where they were useless. These were all things that were known to have been involved with the Belgium enterprise at, in the Congo. Atkinson says that Marlowe sees British imperialism as being different on the basis of efficiency and idea. For example, on page 127 of the Norton text, Marlowe says, what saves us is efficiency, the devotion to efficiency, and then what redeems us is the idea only. That idealism is predominant early on in the story with the comparison by the narrator to the knights errant of the sea on page 126, or later in Marlowe's Ant, speaking of Marlowe weaning those ignorant millions from their horrid ways on page 131. Indeed, that idealism seems to fall apart early on in Marlowe's trip as he becomes disillusioned by the people involved. Marlowe sees the Grove of Death on page 134 and contacts one of the natives who's been forced to build the railroad. The young man has a string of yarn tied around his neck, which is a minor decoration, but Marlowe really latches onto it and really concentrates on wondering its point of origin. This is immediately contrasted with Marlowe's first encounter with the accountant and his perfect social appearance. And despite living in the jungle in a you know, dirty, hot environment, he has a perfect white starched shirt, he has oiled hair, he's maintained his perfect civilized appearance. It's interesting to note that his ability to do so, we find out, is a result of a more, like, personal type of imperialization, I guess you could say, in his training of a young local woman. Through the constant juxtaposition of the actions of the civilized with those of the native, Marlowe is exposed to some of the worst of civilized society. The accountant has no sense of sympathy for the sick agent who's brought into his office on page 135, nor for the beaten black man who's accused of burning the grass hunt on page 138. Uh, what he sees of them is he sees them as a obstacle to him doing his own work, that their noise makes it hard for him to do correct entries into his ledgers. Marlowe overhears the political backstabbing strategy of the manager and the manager's uncle on page 143 as they talk about what to do about Kurtz in order to uh, maintain the manager's career and protect it. The ultimate example, of course, comes from the true subject of the story, Kurtz himself, who is described by all of the characters in romantic, idealistic terms 
only for Marlowe to find out that he's placed himself among the natives as a god, and in fact has been committing various atrocities, including implications of human sacrifice, in his name. It's interesting to note that many of the characters and events in Heart of Darkness were common tropes for popular adventure fiction at the time, which appeared in places such as Blackwood's Magazine. Jonah Raskin points out in Imperialism, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, that things like the beautiful African mistress or the shouting attacking natives with, with colonists firing back with guns, these were common images in, mag in magazines like Blackwood's, as they specialized from tales of from the outpost. The fall of Kurtz is another part of this. As Raskin also points out, there were a number of people who believed that Europe should just stay out of the Congo altogether, that it was impossible for a civilized man to spend time there and not become a savage, that by his mere presence he would be corrupted. Kurtz definitely would seem symbolic of this fear and this clash between imperial ideology and primitive lust. Certainly, Kurtz arrives in Africa with the ideals of civilization driving him. He wants to better his position so that he can marry his intended. He arrives as an artist who speaks, uh, who everyone speaks of as, he is, as if he is the best imperialistic society has to offer. However, that gives way to an insatiable lust for ivory and for portraying himself as a god. He eventually puts himself above everything, including the idea itself. However, what makes Conrad's work different from the popular fiction at the time that was coming, uh, that was about the the uh, Africa imperialism, is that Marlowe's return to civilization and his his realization that the civilized world isn't that much different than the savage one he just left. As you can see on page 122, in another quote from the correspondence between Conrad and Blackwood. Uh, this would be in the page just before the story starts in the Norton text. Conrad says that the conversation between Marlowe and Kurtz's intended separates the work from that of a simple story of Kurtz's going insane in Africa, which is what makes it different from, you know, the other popular fiction at the time. In his meeting with the intended, beginning on page 171, we once again see worship of Kurtz, not all that different, actually, from the worship of the natives in Africa. We see a feminine worshiper adorned in modern ritualistic decorations, such as her black morning gown, and this is speaking of Kurtz's intended, and she praises Kurtz, practically worships him, just like the adorned African woman on the side of the river did as they took Kurtz away from the jungle. The world around the intended turns dark for Marlowe. He seems to see that the heart of darkness is not in Africa, but in England as well. In fact, it's within all men. It's within an all society. That's the true imposition of imperialism. Through forcing imperialism upon the so-called savage, attempting to change them, society exposes itself to the realization of its own savage nature. Symbols of the clash between the primitive and the imperial run throughout the story. The steamboat the Marlowe is to captain is sunk by rocks. They are attacked by natives at the urging of Kurtz whenever he doesn't want them to take him away. Kurtz then attempts to return to the natives, which again compromises the very goal of Marlowe's mission to begin with and what society as a whole thinks would be better. Despite all that, Conrad does not portray the primitive as being on equal footing in this this battle between the primitive and the civilized. The boat is eventually fixed and they make it to the post. In fact, the attacking natives are dispersed by the whistle, which you can see as a symbol of civilized trade and of society in general. Kurtz is captured and is removed from the wilderness, and as he lays dying, he speaks of civilized things like his career and his intended, almost like the things he did with the natives never really happened, right up until his uh, final words where he makes a realization that we're never actually told specifically what it is, but he says, the whore, the whore, uh, and that phrase has been uh, uh, hotly debated and theorized throughout uh, academia on this particular book. Ultimately, though, despite all the obstacles, imperialism succeeds in its goal. It gets what it came for, just like the Romans, whenever they came to, to England, got what they came for. However, what did this imperialism really accomplish? 
at the end of the story, for Marlowe, it would seem that this the that England has accomplished very little by this trip in, into the Congo. England, which he once saw as an enlightened land, is it turns out is savage in its own ways. He sees the actions of the people around him as being meaningless and trite, and then obviously with his conversation with the intended, he sees that there's a lot of parallels between what he considered to be savaged and the world that he considered to be civilized. As Marlowe says to the narrator at the beginning of the story, speaking of London, and this also has been one of the dark places of the earth. Now, Marlowe uh, leaves us to decide whether or not that has changed. He never actually says specifically. However, one thing that is for certain, based on a comparison of the narrator's language at the beginning and end of the book, and this is the original narrator, not Marlowe himself, it's that the narr narrator's outlook on his mission has been shifted as a result of Marlowe's story. No doubt this is probably the reaction that Conrad expected from his audience at the time, and probably the reason the the book is told from the perspective of a narrator listening to a story to begin with. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, be sure to leave any comments if you have any questions.